welcome to Live in the Hive. It's Sunday, it's eight o'clock and there's no other place to be if you want to get a fix of the theatre world, especially here in Greater Manchester. This is the only online magazine show that is going to give you that. We've got news and interviews with some of the best people in the industry tonight. Oh, you are definitely in for a treat. We've got two cracking players to talk about and our guests are unbelievable yes we have got the stars of beginning now this is coming very soon to the royal exchange the stars are erin and gerard playing laura and danny as you can see there it's a two-hander and it's all about love and the first beginnings of love now talking of love as well you know it takes us to the other guests on our show because everybody has been talking about this production lemons 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 that's yes lemons five times has opened at harold pinter in the west end and i have got the creatives from that production who are going to be chatting to me very very soon i've got the director josie rourke and the playwright sam steiner as you can see there the stars are aiden turner and jenna coleman they took to the stage this week so we're going to be finding out all about that production again a really good two-hander not only that that every week we bring you the latest in greater manchester theatre news we've got some good news and we've got some really disappointing news this week i'll be telling you more in about 15 minutes time do stay with us we are on for 30 minutes here on the isle of manchester facebook page and also the uh, live in the hive facebook page as well we are here as i say every sunday night oh and this week well i've got a little bit of the lurk going on you might have noticed with my throat i don't sound like the caramel bunny when i've got a cold it's not sexy it's not raspy it's just very man but there's nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that at all as they say in the theater world the show must go on and as i say we've got a cracking night for you so let's kick it off without further ado i mentioned before lemons 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 has opened in the west end it's coming to us in march it's all very very exciting and you know what the people behind this production are northerners too so it's guaranteed to be great i caught up with the director josie rock and the playwright sam steiner earlier this week and this is what they have to say i'm from salford most of the family are kind of in and around eccles and uh sam's a proper mancunian i'm from didsbury yeah and jenna right. coleman is blackpool's own jenna coleman so it's very much a kind of big homecoming for us with agent turner there as a kind of honorary irishman yeah Absolutely. And the thing is as well, the audience there is going to be electric, right? If you've got all those people that are connected to you in the house and it's going down like a storm with ticket sales here in Manchester. Yeah, I actually had to pop in uh, on Boxing Day uh, just to have a look at the auditorium and work out where we could open up some more seats because uh, the ones that we put on sale had sold already. Oh, wow, that's amazing. It really is. And this is a play that you wrote back when you were 21 sam yeah. you know and to see where it has gone in like the past eight years and now debuting in the west end which i believe you've got press night tonight is that just incredible for you to kind of see how that journey has gone for you oh absolutely yeah i mean it's completely baffling if i'm honest michelle um and uh yeah very surreal and very exciting and uh, it's not something that I ever I could have ever imagined or would have even thought to imagine really and so um to get to get to revisit the play in this context with this with, with Josie and with those two actors and an absolutely stonking creative team has been an incredible and unguessable experience although I would say it is a cracking play and it should be uh, you know in Manchester and in the West End and you know, it, it it certainly merits a production of this scale. Audiences, we've had some previews at our opening night tonight, are absolutely loving it. I love the premise of it, though. I mean, coming up with this at the age of 21, it's like a world where the legislation is you're only allowed to say 140 words every day. I mean, I can't even get to grips with Twitter with like trying to shorten what I'm going to put on a tweet. How do you do that in a day? <laughs> Well, that's a lot of the the drama of the play. I think it's um it's watching these two people 
uh, figure out how they um, figure out their kind of communication with each other and figure out what that restriction brings out and what that makes them, you know, that it makes them think about the words they're using in a, in a totally new way. Was social media the inspiration then that kick-started this? There was no real lightning bolt moment. It just kind of like, we just started chatting and it came out. Um, you know, the, the 140 word number that we put on it is definitely kind of directly inspired by Twitter. But I don't think, I don't think the play is overly interested in social media. Um, I think it's just uh, a, a kind of jumping off point. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the play's name. I know I said all of those words together. It wasn't the first kind of the the, the feeling that you were going to get for what it was called, was it? I think there was loads of different ideas for the name of the play. And then that one kind of took off. Yeah, yeah. I We didn't have a name for it for, for ages, actually. It took a while um, uh, to to land on it um and the name you know the lemons 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 the name that we settled in is a reference to a very specific scene in the play um that uh we're not going to spoil for you we're not going to spoil for you um and so but yeah it was it was a really hard one to figure out the name for and it just kind of when when we finally settled on lemons it all kind of clicked and made sense yeah oh i love that you're not going to spoil it is there one spoiler we're not going to have as well apparently in each production of this play there is a song that gets played and with each production a different song is chosen have you chosen well i imagine you've chosen that song can you divulge what it is many songs. and actually there's no accompaniment they have to sing it on their own yeah acapella yeah uh, can, can we reveal it or Shh. no come on Michelle. Oh, come on i mean this is great journalism, it's great yeah. journalism but you're not going to break us no, no. Um, you read this in the lockdown, didn't you, in the pandemic, Josie? And what was it like on that first read? Did you instantly go, God, you know, I, I, I want to get involved with this. This is incredible. So I've read before, actually, um, uh, years and years ago, but um, I, I reconnected it with it in the pandemic. And I think, you know, it's not a pandemic play. It's not set in the pandemic. It's not thinking explicitly about it. It was written before then. But you know, it, it, it certainly is a very good play, I think, for bringing together an audience and allowing us a little bit of space to reflect on what happens to our lives when an external force comes in over which we've got no control and changes overnight the circumstances under which we live and cohabit and hold our relationships and our workspaces. You know, and just, just like a really great question in the play for a relationship drama um, is... You've got 140 words. Are you spending all of them at work? Are you saving some for home? If one of you's work from home and works mainly on their own, like one of the characters is a composer, you know, they might be left with a lot of words at the end of the day and their partner might come home with a handful. And what does that mean? What tension does that put on the relationship? And, you know, I think a lot of things happen. A lot of things happened to our relationships during lockdown, didn't they? But it really did throw into relief, I think, um, how our working lives cope with it and what impact that then might subsequently have. How do you work with the actors on getting used to that? You know, is are there certain exercises that you do, certain role play? Because I imagine that in itself is difficult, Josie. Yeah, I mean, I think that we've got these two exceptional actors. And one of the things that they're both extremely practised and compelling at is creating characters. So a lot of the questions that we're asking in rehearsal are about who exactly we think these people are. It's a solicitor, it's a composer, um, it's someone who's from a bit of a posher background, it's someone who's from um, a more working class background. Um, one of them appears and presents as very, very cultured. One of them is less comfortable in some of those kind of more cultured and cultural and conversational spaces. So, you know, broad ideas like that. And then just on the nuance of every moment, it's not a tremendously long play. It's coming in at the moment at about what, like, 85 I think it was 85 minutes long last night that'll vary a bit so there's a lot of time we've had to investigate in great detail minute detail every single moment in between those two people just these two people on stage and just really work out what's going on and 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 hopefully bring both authentic and fascinating and also speak to our own lives and experience and do we see just them on the stage is it kind of a sparse set because you know, it doesn't feel like it possibly needs much else. They have no props. 
Yeah, they've got no props, but the set actually has over 2,000 objects in it. Mm. They just don't touch them. One of the, one of the most amazing aspects of this process has been seeing Rob Jones, the designer, come in and make something kind of truly magical and moving out of um, out of a play that was that was written without a set in mind. Yeah, because when it started off and you did uh, like the fringe, it, it must have been completely different and stripped back back then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was written to be cheap, essentially. Uh, like, like most of the fringe, <laughs> it's expensive. Um, but uh, we've. I think what Rob's managed to do is find a kind of way of giving the play a real scale and a real kind of sense of uh, like wonder um, that uh, that we could never have achieved on a studio in a in a studio theatre. Um, and seeing seeing the play grow with that and because of that has been has been pretty magical. And it needs scale. I mean, the Opera House is is a beautiful big theatre. Like you know, we need to service that element of theatre, which is about the visual life in in this case you know one of the most spectacularly large theatres in the northwest oh i know and it's going to be great as i said to have it here because you know as well as having like the, the play here and plays coming to manchester you know that have come direct from the west end I and mean, in sometimes they've come before they come to the west end i think the platform is changing now for the north don't you yeah and i think there's a vast appetite um, for quality work in Manchester, you know, I mean, I saw, um, I've probably seen more productions at the Manchester Royal Exchange than I have at any other theatre. The first sort of proper piece of theatre I saw that wasn't a panto, not the panto isn't proper, was at the Manchester Opera House. It was My Fair Lady, my mum taking me when I was a little kid, you know, and, and I think that, I think that Manchester has always, um, in different ways, had a really strong relationship with star power and star talent, you know, I think it yeah. is a city for stars. Definitely. I do feel it is a time that it's getting more of a recognition for that and it's kind of put itself on the map. Um, you yeah. that great mayor. <laughs> <laughs> he is very good. I do like mm. him, Mr. Burnham. But Josie, I mean, you're putting us on the map as well as, you know, a female and a northern woman being, you know, artistic director at the Bush Theatre, the Don Mar Warehouse, the first female artistic director. That must be a, a bit of a pinch me moment for the younger you. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, it's really all credit to my amazing parents uh, who are still in Eccles, who did nothing but encourage and support me in my increasingly wild ideas and schemes about having a career. You know, they were that they, they took me to the theatre. Um, you know, they were incredibly encouraging. When I said I wanted to be a theatre director, they didn't go stop and get a proper job. You know, I was extremely fortunate and lucky in that respect. And the support continues. My mum's flogged 50 tickets already. Um, so yes, him, mother. I know, I know. It's pretty great, isn't it? And and I do think that there are incredible opportunities if you grow up in and around Manchester to see great work and be inspired. You know, what made me want to be a theatre director was seeing the plays that I saw at the Royal Exchange, notable productions at the then Dan's House Theatre. Um, I've just done a production of As You Like It, actually, that was very inspired by seeing Adrian Lester tour to the dance house in Manchester with the production of that play 20 odd years ago. So yeah, that was formative for me, my theatre going, and that's what inspired me. I didn't see a play in London until I was 19, I don't think. Wow. And was the same for you then, Sam, being in Didsbury? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the Royal Exchange, like Josie, the Royal Exchange is kind of like form very formative to me um, and my theatre going life. And it kind of, I, I really remember seeing production of Simon Stevens plays punk rock there. And um, I love Port as well. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah another play. beautiful, beautiful play. And I think knowing that that was written by someone who was from near where, where I was from, uh, and seeing I remember in punk rock seeing like the audience's reactions to it, seeing that whole theater kind of absolutely held in the uh, the kind of drama of the moment. Uh, really made it kind of gave me a new idea of what theater could do and made it thrilling and um possible. I guess. 
Great to speak to Josie and Sam there. They are absolutely smashing it and really paving the way for Greater Manchester. Brilliant to see the passion in both of them about our city, just like live in the hive. We love championing Greater Manchester. And also love the fact that these productions are coming to our fine city as well. Don't forget, it comes to Manchester in March. If you've got yourself a ticket, you are very lucky. They are going like hotcakes. Definitely one to watch that one. Now, still to come on the show, I'm going to be chatting to Erin and Gerard. They're from another two-hander, which is coming our way this time at the Royal Exchange. It's coming in a couple of weeks' time. I'll get the latest and the lowdown on that one. But of course, every week, we do like to bring you the latest on what's going on in the theatre world. So it's time now for this. Yes, it is Greater Manchester Theatre News and this week I've got to say it has been tinged with sadness because of the news from the Oldham Coliseum. Now this happened earlier this week. The Oldham Coliseum has cancelled its spring summer productions uh, and this is from the 26th of March that it's going to be doing all the forthcoming events and it's as a result of 100% of its funding being cut from Arts Council England. We heard this news back in November last year. This is as a result of that one, and it is terribly upsetting for all of those people involved, for Oldham as a community and all the people it has helped along the way. You know, this is a place that has been going since 1885. It's really helped so many careers, both on stage and off stage, it really does seem a crime that the funding has been cut for the Oldham Coliseum. I know lots of talks are currently going on to try and see if anyone can help this. We're lending our support, as is Maxine Peake, Julie Hesmontage, and a lot of the people on the City Council. So fingers crossed. I know there's a petition that you can sign and also some funding pages that have been set up. So we'll keep you posted on that one. Really do hope things change for the Coliseum. I grew up watching shows there. I absolutely love it. It brings to, to the theatre the most diverse productions as well and lots of community shows too. So as I say, really, really sad news for the Coliseum. If you have got tickets for the productions after the 26th, when the closure will take place, they are going to be refunding them. The best thing to do is get in touch with the Coliseum directly. Now, a little bit of something to uplift us is we have got a new musical on its way. And this one is really making waves. It's coming to the Lowry from the 28th of March to the 1st of April. It's called Cake, the Marie Antoinette Playlist. It's a brand new musical. It's a bit of a gig as well. And it's been touted as the new six. Yes, it's modern. It's got an Olivier Award winning creative team behind it. Drew McConey, he is leading the way here. And as I say, it is going to be quite quirky and different. You've got a great cast. You've got fresh from the run of her starring role in Mary Poppins, Zizzy Strallen. I love her. She's going to be starring as Marie Antoinette. And it's written by Morgan Lloyd Malcolm, a brilliant person to write this production. As I say, choreographed and directed by Drew McConey and songs by Tasha Taylor Johnson and Jack McManus. Definitely one to watch this one. I think, you know, the story of Marie Antoinette, we know she said, let them eat cake, but do we know a lot more about her? Well, well, you're going to combine music with the 18th century France to retell this story that sparked a revolution. I would definitely go and see this one if you can. As I say, if rumour has it that it's going to be like six, you'll want to see it first hand. So that is coming very, very soon in March and heading to us until the 1st of April. Now, we had some great awards this week, and this is one of the winners of the awards. It, of course, was the Stage Awards 2023. They celebrate achievements in UK theatre over the past 12 months. And this particular venue that you're seeing on the screen now was one of those winners. It got Theatre Building of the Year. And of course, it is Shakespeare North Playhouse in Prescott. I've mentioned this quite a few times since it was opened last year. And my goodness, it is absolutely stunning inside. Look at that. 
big congratulations to them and what they have done here for the North. Uh, a really well-deserved award that they picked up there. And not only them, but do you know what? The people who really help us behind the scenes were recognised as well. The unsung heroes, and they are the front of house staff. You can see there you've got Jill Doyle Davidson. She picked up one for the Savoy in London. Sheila Howard for Leeds Playhouse. And James, high five to you. He's known as Jim. Jim Waite, Octagon Theatre, Bolton. He's one of the front house staff that was given the accolade of Unsung Hero by the stage. And rightly so. Congratulations to all those wonderful winners. And what better way to finish off Greater Manchester's Theatre News this week than with a review of one of the latest productions at the Lowry. We sent our newest member of the Live in the Hive team, our reporter George Ike, to find out all about it. What did he think though? Over to you, George. Hi, Michelle. Lovely to join you in the hive. I have to say, you're looking very lovely as well in your hive, although from my hive to yours. Um, but yeah, chatting Edith this evening, which was on at the Larry this week. And I have to say, it was a real treat to go and see something like this because I've never been to an intimate drama performance like that before, performed in a studio rather than on stage at a theatre to a much, much smaller audience. Now, the first thing I found particularly striking about this show was the minute that we walked through the door into the studio, all of the cast were already on stage and I found it a little bit unsettling at first and I was thinking this is really strange. Um, a, a cast of four actors who were all phenomenal, one of which was Harriet Maidley who also wrote the production and it was just exceptional, really clever. Now the title Edith comes from the main character Edith Thompson and she's the defendant in a trial in the 1920s. She was one of the last women to ever be hung for murder and she's accused of murdering her husband. Now. Still today, we don't know whether she actually did or didn't murder her husband, but I suppose that's really the point of the story, is that back then in the 1920s, women didn't particularly get a fair ride in the criminal justice system. And Harriet Maidley, who I actually chatted to before the show, explains here how maybe still today they don't quite. So while we were doing the, um, the development for this, that was the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, and... It was, yeah, loads of parallels, just everybody so kind of obsessed with this. I couldn't stop talking about it, but also like quite divided. But I was just fascinated by most the fact that most of the attention was on Amber Heard. Like everyone, a lot of people came out in defense of Johnny Depp. Like anyway, like whatever you think about that case. Um, she was at, she was the focal point of all of the hatred. But an absolutely exceptional piece of drama. And Harriet Maidley wrote this alongside female prisoners to get a good feel for the justice system. And I would say she's got it absolutely spot on. A masterpiece of drama. Back to you in the hive, Michelle. Time now for the second interview of the night. And I got to chat with two lovely actors who are about to star in Beginning at the Royal Exchange. It's a two-hander, it's intimate, it's in a great venue in the round as the exchange is. They're northern, they are talented, and they told me a few nuggets about what to expect. And also, Erin revealed that the Royal Exchange is somewhere she used to be, but in a different role. Um, I used to work on a chocolate shop in the Royal Exchange. Um, so I used to watch the shows through the glass and watch all the actors and, um, and, I, and I would come here and see shows. And I, I guess in terms of it doing, uh, doing it sort of on home turf is the access for the people to be able to come and see it, which is really lovely. So I think similar to what you said, I, it's wonderful to do it. And then I guess, yeah, people can come and see it you know, locally and yeah, that's, it's very exciting. It's a very big deal and it's exciting and thrilling. And the play itself is, as I said, this two-hander, it's you guys, you're meeting for the first time. It's a flat warming, is it? And then kind of, yeah. is there the awkwardness of kind of meeting and then thinking, oh, some feelings are now involved. Do we act on it? Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's a great, it's a brilliant challenge um, that definitely attracts me to the play as an actor. Having that, you know, filling that space, the dialogue, the writing, um, you know, the chemistry between the two characters and the awkwardness and the humour. Um, more and more as we rehearse, we're, we're, I'm finding, I don't know about you, yeah, I'm yeah. finding the humour in it. And I think the audience will love that. I think they'll really get on board with these characters and they'll really feel for these characters. 
and at times they'll be frustrated with the characters yeah. and they'll see two individuals you know colliding and conflicting and and I'm laughing and enjoying this time together and the audience are going to feel very much part of it yeah it's going to be a real collective experience not only for the actors but uh, you know as in, importantly the audience as well yeah I, su I suppose it's something that we can all draw on can't we really you know those first times of you know the butterflies that you feel and the yeah. things the way that you act maybe you kind of like say something to make yourself look impressive when really you haven't yeah. got a clue who was in that movie or yeah. you don't yeah. like that topic yeah. but you know for yeah. that moment you're like yeah yeah i am yeah yeah yeah, yeah. everything is so high stakes um and so it's all a bit yeah you know the, when it's great, it's great. When it's bad, it's bad. And sort of the knee-jerk reaction to things where you're you're trying to figure someone out, but you're also trying to play it cool, but then you've also got to be truthful and just it's so real to and the more you certainly the more I read it, the more I look at it, you go, Oh yeah, this is what happens. It's and each step they take is new and the audience sort of take it with them because nothing's planned. It's you know, it's like everyone's trapped in the room together. Um, and I think with it being in the round as well, it adds so much to the audience can't hide either. Like if we're awkward, they're stuck with us. And each moment, you know, they have to sort of get through with us. Yeah. Or if the actor, if the character is experiencing or feeling something and the character wants to hide that from the other character, they're going to show that to the audience, yeah. whoever are there or there. And it's yeah. really interesting about you saying how your behavior changes. If you're around someone, you, you, you act, you know, not only do you try to impress, you know, you probably cross the line as well in, in, in how you are. And you're thinking, why did I say that? Why did I do that? I've never I don't even mean do that. that. Yeah. yeah. And do you know, think, so that do you really think, rings true. Do you think we're different as well as we become older about how we are in those situations? Do you think we have less inhibitions when we're younger? Do you know what I mean? Of like maybe approaching somebody and putting ourselves out there, but as we're older, do we find it a little bit more difficult? I think I would like to think I got cooler as I got older. And I think my needs and wants became clearer, but how I asked for them didn't get any cooler. I think in those situations, for me, it's, you, you feel so childlike and playful and terrified and it, the adrenaline takes over. So you're not sort of behaving as you would normally, as it were. Um, so, yeah, time is more precious. I think you're far more aware of time the older you get. And um, so th there's less messing about to a point. You know what you want, um, but it doesn't make it any smoother trying to get it. Certainly not in my history. <laughs> You know, I don't think you're as aware of all the things when when you're older. You're aware of everything, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. You know, like you were saying about inhibitions. You, you'd be aware of, so you know the consequences or how things could be interpreted mm -hmm. a lot more than things can be thrown away. When you're young, you, you throw away your words, you throw yeah. away... You throw away everything. Yeah. Um, you don't even think, you don't rationalize, and then you're older. And then you've got no you got no time. Like mm -hmm. you, you you know, what are you about, you know, what do you want? Well, it mm. it's because you forward thinking, you're Definitely. aware. It's, and do we see more educated and premeditated and ugh. do we see it unfold over one night, Erin and Gerard, or or is it just one night? That is that's intense. Yeah, real yeah, time. Really intense. Yeah. It's really intense. Yeah, you're with the moment to moment. There's no, you know, leaving and having time to think and then, you know, time passage. It is moment to moment. Uh, yeah, it, it, in, in real time, just seeing how they sort of navigate things and try to get things back on track. And then yeah. it keeps derailing and quickly get it back on track. And, and time, yeah, it's very interesting and, and thrilling again, to, you know, discovering things in in that way yeah and what's it like you're rehearsing right now for it how's the rehearsal process 
been because I know Bryony is directing this, the Joint Artistic Director. Uh, how's that been? Been gorgeous, been really, really nice. And I think what's so lovely about with it being a two-hander is we're both just in all the time. It's not, oh, we'll work on that scene. So you guys, it, it's it's so intense, but in a way it's, it's incredible. And Brian, again, she's with us every single step of the way. So we're sort of figuring it all out together and you think you know it and then you don't. And then you make another discovery one day and then that just absolutely U-turns everything. And then, you know, but, but then again, so similar to what's actually happening in the play, you think you know where you're going and then you don't. You think you're mm -hmm. back on track and then you're not. And, yeah, so it's, I'm, freaking, I'm thinking so much about myself and realisations and, you know, it's it's studying humans, isn't it, and behaviour and so it's fascinating, yeah. We are going to be racing to see you and Erin in this production of Beginning. I cannot wait. I am terrible though because as a former actor myself, the Royal Exchange for me is when I sit on the banquette seats, I have to sit on my hands because otherwise... I want to come and join in the action. So, Gerald, you might have a few people on that stage to kind of choose from. Uh, I'll brilliant. try not to do that, I promise. I promise. I'll leave a script for you, so if anything happens okay. to me, Michelle, you'll... Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good, good idea. Luck with it all. I'm sure it's going to be absolutely fabulous, and I really do hope you like your debut at the Royal Exchange. No more chocolate selling at all, Erin. Thank you so much. Oh, I can't wait to see that production. And great to talk to Erin and Gerard there. If you do fancy heading to the theatre, though, and want to know what's going on, there is only one place to go and visit. And that, of course, is I Love Manchester's website. They've got all the listings on there and some brilliant reviews. And also, do catch up with us as we go through the week, see what we're up to out and about in the theatre world. You can give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram at Live in the Hive 21. And of course, we are here every Sunday. Sunday night on Facebook on the I Love Manchester Facebook page and also our Live in the Hive Facebook page too and we are looking to extend our team so if you do have an interest in theatre and want to get involved in Live in the Hive drop me a line we are looking for some theatre reviewers and some people who might be up for doing some interviews if that is you or you know somebody who is that person, then pass on the email address below. It's live in the hive UK at gmail.com. And you could be joining me on this weekly online theatre magazine show. A big thanks to our guests this week, the wonderful Josie, Sam, Erin and Gerard. We will be back next week for more theatre news and interviews. Until then, have a great week and I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>